We're turning your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. We continue, of course, our study of the book of Daniel. If you remember, the book of Daniel is about a young man named Daniel, and there's three of his companions that are also mentioned in the book. They were all taken off into captivity in about 605 B.C. The nation of Israel had turned away from God. God allowed the Babylonians to come in to conquer them and to take them off. And then Daniel and these friends were put in a training program and uh, over three years, and then, all, and then they were raised up, and God gave them special everything. They were smarter than everybody else. They knew better. So Nebuchadnezzar put him in his personal service, and Daniel could could interpret dreams and things. And as we saw last week, the dream of the big the big of uh, the big statue and the head of gold and the arms and chest of silver and all of that, and Daniel interpreted it, showing the kingdoms to come, even to the future. And so we saw some great things there. Well, this morning, as we continue, it's another famous story. Most of the time, if you said the book of Daniel, you'd say, Daniel's in the lion's den, and then most everybody else would say, the three boys in the fiery furnace. Well, this morning, we're going to look at, let me see if I can get there, the fiery furnace. The three Hebrew boys are thrown into what they call the fiery furnace. Why were they thrown in? What did they do? What happened? Well, there's some great truths. And we see, and we've already read it, but we see they stood for what they knew was right, which was to obey the living God and not to worship false gods. And so they stood for that, and they're risking their lives. In fact, most likely they feel like they're going to be thrown in the fire and burned to death. So here's some questions for us to, stand, to talk about. Think about, what do you stand for? What are your unchanging principles? And we're talking about from the Scripture. What do you believe that you will not change? And what are you willing to die for? You know, people say things like, oh, I, I would die for Jesus. Well, the truth is he wants you to live for him. But there may come a time in our country that to stand for Jesus Christ may mean death. What are you willing to die for? Why do trials come into our life? Romans 8, 28 says, God works all things together for good. We know that sometimes things happen. First Peter says that trials come in our lives to test us. James chapter 1, verse 3 says, the testing of your faith works patience. In other words, as you trust God through the trials, you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior. Trials are allowed in our lives to trust Him. Now, here's the question. When things go wrong, will we trust God? When things go wrong, and because the truth is, things will go wrong. It doesn't matter in our lives, and we can say, this is really good, this is really good, this is, this is not very good. I mean, in all our lives, even in the midst of good things, there are always negative things or bad things. Things go wrong. Things don't always work out the way we wish they did. This morning, things go wrong in the lives of these three, a lot of times we only say three Hebrew boys. We're not sure how old they are at this time. They may be in their 20s by this time. We just don't know. We know that they were taken off into captivity as young, possibly as 14 or 15. They've been in training. They may be 18, 19. They could be 20 to 21 at this age. We just don't know. But things go wrong, and it gets as bad as it can get because it's this way. If you don't do what we say, you die. This morning, we see what these boys did. When you think about the story of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it's been called many things. I remember I had this little girl that was in Sunday school, and she used to say Shadrach, Meshach, and Billy Goat. And then I had a friend that would say, my shack and your shack and a bungalow. And so it's really Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we see three men caught with the desire to live for, for God, or do they obey the king who has the right to put them to death. You ever been in a situation like that where you had to make a decision? Where maybe it was something in your business, maybe it was something in your office, somebody asked you to do something wrong. Somebody said, just do that. That's the way we do that around here. And you don't do that. What are you going to do? Or maybe you've been with a bunch of friends and, and maybe you don't drink or something, but somebody says, hey, we're all going to go drink. Are we going to take these, we're going to smoke this, are we going to drink? And you say, well, I don't really do that. But everybody else does it. And everybody else says, what's the difference? We're all, nobody's going to know anyway. What do you do? This morning, we see this story, a powerful story from the Bible. Well, let me give you the outline of the passage. We're going to see just the first 18 verses today. We'll see the rest of it next week. Nebuchadnezzar's image is in verses 1 through 7. The Hebrews are accused at 8 through 12, and we see their answer. 
what happens there. So let's start with the image. Nebuchadnezzar builds a statue. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. The height of it was 60 cubits and the width 6 cubits. He set it upon the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, he made this big statue. And the word image of gold actually implies an image of a person. So we think he made this statue that looked like a person. And you might say, wonder why he would do that. Remember, he just had a dream, and the dream was a big statue. And he was the head of gold, and then there was chest and arms of silver, and belly and thigh of bronze, and legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. And so I think Nebuchadnezzar is saying, you know, I'm the head of gold, so maybe, maybe I should be the whole statue of gold. We don't know what he's thinking. And it was in the form of a person. But when it says the height, when it says uh, six, uh, 60 or when it says the height was 60 cubits, that's 90 feet, by the way. And the width was 6 cubits, that's 9 feet. Now, if you think about that, that's strange. The statue is 9 stories tall, but it's only 9 feet wide. And some people have looked at it like this. This is a guy by the name of Ted Larson. He made this drawing up, and, and the statue is just like a real tall, thin person. Some even said it's like a, a big pencil, but it's a person. We've looked through history, and there are some, especially in Egypt, they had uh, people, but their shapes were not what we'd say is proportion. And so maybe this is not that unusual. I think he says, I'm the head of gold. So the whole thing is going to be gold, and this is symbolic, I think, of Nebuchadnezzar. I think that's what he's doing. So he made this image of gold. The height was 60 cubits, which is 90 feet, and the width was 6 cubits, which was 9 feet. He sets it upon the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, it's covered over with gold. Some people say, think that it's an entirely gold statue. We don't know for sure. Some believe that it's possibly wood covered over with gold. If it was wood covered over with gold, it would be worth $2.5 billion. So it's just whatever it is, it's just very wealth, you know, a lot of wealth. And so he, the Plain of Dura is a place, we find it today, it's just about six miles southeast of Babylon. They, in fact, they've discovered there's a big large area, that's a big flat area. Sometimes people call that the Plain of Dura, which is listed here in the Bible. It's in the ba Babylon. Now, here's what's amazing about it. This is the area near Shinar, which most people believe in the book of Genesis is where they tried to build the Tower of Babel. In this same area, that's where Babel and Babylon come from. The Tower of Babel, it confused their language. So we'll just see it. Notice, and there's something that the way it's written in Hebrew, it's 60 cubits. It was actually list six times 10 cubits, and uh, it lists six a number of times. And by the way, in the Bible, man was created on the sixth day. Uh, man's rule and uh, his plans come back to six. And when you think of the Antichrist, the beast that rises from the sea, what's his number? The number of his name is what? Six, six, six. The six is the number of man. So the, there seems to be some symbolism here that it was 90 feet tall or six times 10 cubits and six cubits wide. Now watch what happens. So then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. So he calls for people to come, and without going into a lot of detail, the traps were these chief representatives, the prefects were military, uh, the, the governors had to do with civil government, the, council, the, uh, the ones that's called counselors had to do with, uh, with uh, advising, treasurers dealt with the money, the judges ruled, the magistrates helped rule with the judges, and the rulers of the provinces, it doesn't tell us who they are, but I believe that the best we can tell is they're probably some of the people who are the counselors, that, uh, the wise men that we might call them. So we're going to find that Daniel's friends are there. Now, I'm going to raise a question. We'll come back to it in a minute. Is Daniel at this meeting? Is Daniel there? If you notice the book, if you've read chapter 3, we read the first 18 verses today. If you read the rest of it, Daniel's never mentioned in chapter 3. Daniel's mentioned in chapter 1, and Daniel's mentioned in chapter 2, and Daniel's mentioned in chapter 4, and chapter 5, and chapter 6, and chapter 7, and chapter 8, and chapter 9, and chapter 10, and chapter 11, and chapter 12, but he's not mentioned in chapter 3. I wonder why. We'll see. We'll talk about it. Look what happened. Notice the end of verse 2 says, they came to the dedication of the image. Now, if you get called to come, what do you hear? Nebuchadnezzar made this big statue. We're all coming. He's going to dedicate the statue. And we go something like, okay. I mean, we're supposed to come because he told us to come, right? I mean, that's, that's why we come. Listen to what he says. Verse 4. 
Then the herald loudly proclaimed. Everybody got there. He says, to you it is commanded. It, to, to you the command is given, O peoples of nations and men of every language. Everybody here, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, when you hear the music, you're to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Now, that's different than coming to a dedication. He's saying you got to worship. So if you're, let's, 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 you're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're there, and you're, you're coming because you've been appointed to come. You're one of the counselors of the king. You're one of the wise men, and you're there. All three of you are there, and they say, okay, when you hear this, you will all bow down and worship the statue. You look at each other and go, well, nobody said anything about worship when we were coming here. They said dedication. This is worship. And what do you say to that? Let me ask you a question. If somebody came to you and said, we want you all to bow down and worship an idol that we're going to put right down here in front, what would you say to that? I, I hope every one of us in the room would go, wait, we don't worship idols. We don't bow down in front of an idol. We, we believe in the true God, the living God. We not wor That's a statue. That's nothing to us. We not bow down for any kind of statue. Well, that's exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. They said, wait a minute. We believe in one true God. We not going to bow down before some statue. I don't care how tall it is. I don't care what it looks like. So when you hear the music, bow down. But then verse 6 says, but whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Now think about that. If you, when you hear the music, you're going to fall down and worship the image. And if you don't fall down and worship, you'll be cast in a fiery furnace. Now, let me ask you a question. Why would Nebuchadnezzar build this statue and want people to worship it? Well, I think it represents him. And so I think one is his rebellion against God because he wants to be worshipped. Remember, he's the head of gold. This goes back to his pride. See, when Daniel told him last week, Daniel said, you are the head of gold. He thought, I am. I am. I'm the most important person on the face of the earth, and everyone should worship me. And I think it's the idea is to unify the empire because he's brought everybody together. So he's made this statue. He wants everybody to realize it represents him, and he wants everybody to bow down. But whoever, whoever doesn't bow down will be cast into the fiery furnace. Now, what does this thing look like? The best we can tell, it looks something like this, that there was a place, uh, and we're going to find that when they get ready to throw the guys into the fiery furnace, they put something up this way, and they throw them down this way. They throw them down into the fire. Nebuchadnezzar later is going to come to the entrance and look in and see what's going on. So there's a furnace like this. They're going to heat it up, and if you, if you didn't bow down, they're going to throw you in that furnace and burn you up. You're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what do you say? I can't do that. That would be false worship. I mean, I can't worship something that's not God. I, I can't do that. And by the way, Satan has always desired this. All false worship and everything ultimately goes back to him. Now, let me, check, let me remind you of something. He wants to be worshipped like God, and he has a false system, a counterfeit system. First of all, he has a false gospel. I want you to understand this, that if you go to the Bible and you start with Adam and Eve, and the message of salvation is faith in the coming seed of woman, the Messiah. If you go all the way up to Noah, you go to Abraham, you go to Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, you go all the way up to Daniel, go up the whole Old Testament, salvation is always by faith, never by works. When you get to the New Testament, and you see Jesus, Jesus whoever believes in me will never perish, but have everlasting life. Paul says it's by grace you're saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We see all the way through the whole Bible, salvation is always by faith. Satan has a false message. It's all throughout the world, and it's works. You do good works to somehow get to God. You and I, we could walk out into this community. We could go downtown. We could stop random people and say, what do you think a person has to do in order to have life? Many, 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 most people will say, try to be good, do the best we can, go to church, you know, keep the Ten Commandments. It's always works. That didn't come from God, and that didn't come from the Bible. That came from Satan and his counterfeit fit gospel. It is a gospel of works. And some of you are brought up hearing that you need to do good things, or you need to do this, or you could believe about Jesus, but you better keep doing good, or you might lose your salvation. All of you have heard things like that. That is a false message. Satan's message is 
Do good. Here, here it is. Do good and God will love you. You can't do good. God already loves you. Okay, It's a false message. But he also has false ministers. There are people that use the name of Jesus Christ and they do not believe in him. And they actually represent themselves or oftentimes they don't even realize it. They're servants of Satan and they don't even realize it. Listen, just be very careful. Sometimes you can turn on the television, you hear some guy and he's talking about Jesus. And when you realize it, his message has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has nothing to do with the Bible. There are false ministers out there. And in reality, they're working for Satan, not working for Jesus. And last but not least, there's a false doctrine. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 says that in the latter times, people will move away from the truth to the doctrine of demons. And that means there are teachings that are in our culture, in our world. People even say they're from the Bible and they're not. And it's out there. There is a false message out there. There's a false gospel, false ministers, and false teaching. You have to be very careful. That's why. You must study the Bible. That's why you must know the scripture so that you can know what is right. So as you study it and when somebody says something, you can say, oh, wait a minute, that's not biblical. That's not true. You've got to be ready. You've got to know. That's why we teach the Bible on Sunday morning in grow groups at our, at our Bible Institute on Wednesday nights at all of your Bible study that we have. We're teaching the Bible to our children back over there right now. When our women meet together, they study the Bible. When our men meet together, we study the Bible. The issue is we've got to know the Word of God so we can live by the Scripture and we can understand it and we can be ready when we hear something that's not biblical. So here's the plan. Everybody's got to bow down. If you don't bow down... You'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. If you were there, what would you do? Couldn't it be easy to go, let's, like, let's bow down, but let's not really worship. Like, we could just pretend. We could pretend. And, no, you know, could, or maybe, maybe we just kind of crouch and everybody thinks we're bowing down. I mean, who knows, right? Right? Fake it. Let's just fake it. Well, what happens? Hebrews are accused. Look at verse 7. I just want you to see that. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigeon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. They all fell down and worshipped. Or did they? It says they did. But did they? What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, look at verse 8. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. The Jews. The Chaldeans were some wise men. Remember, the wise men were sometimes called the Chaldeans. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and so they were part of that group. Well, these Chaldeans come up, and, and they come to the king. And, and look what they say. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. That's what y'all, by the way, if you ever go with the king, always say that. O king, live forever. We want you to live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound, and he lists all the different instruments and everything, he says, when you hear it, isn't that true that you made the decree that when people hear the music, they're to fall down and worship the golden image? Isn't that true? Isn't that what you said? And then he said, but whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Isn't that the deal? And I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar looked at them and said, of course that's the deal. And then they say this. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They have not served your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. He said, there's certain people, they did not bow down. Certain people, and they named the names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it says this, it says, they disregarded you. That's not true. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have never disregarded back the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. They've done what, what he asked them to do as far as their job. Have they not served your gods? The truth is they haven't served the gods of Nebuchadnezzar, and they haven't worshipped the image. So the first charge was not true. They said, they said they, they disregarded you. That's not true. But they haven't served your gods, and they didn't worship the image. And before we go any further, I got to raise a question. Where's Daniel? Did he bow? Let me ask you a question. Of what you know about Daniel, you think he's going to bow down? Huh? You think Daniel's going to bow down? 
Now, why didn't they go Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel? We caught these four guys standing up when everybody else was bound down. Where is Daniel at this time? He's never mentioned. Why is he not mentioned? Well, let me raise some questions. Could he be away on business? Could they have sent him somewhere and he's not there for this point? Or is he in too important? Listen, Daniel has already given the dream. And everybody says, that guy is the top of the line. Could it be that when they saw these four guys standing, that they're not going to accuse Daniel, they will accuse the other three? Could it be that? Or could it be that he's not at the assembly? Could it be that he was sick? Could it be that he was gone? One thing we know for sure, he didn't bow, but he's not charged. So we don't know what happened. I, if, if I'm just guessing, and you know, this is just a guess because it's not in the scripture. I think he's so important that they know that he's already been able to interpret the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and that he is so important to Nebuchadnezzar that they're not going to bring him before the king. I could be wrong. He may just not be there. It just seems strange to me. We know Daniel's character all the way through the book, and he never would bow down to an idol. So we don't know where he is. Well, what happens? The answer, look at verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Now, you, you're going to notice as we go through our study that Nebuchadnezzar, in the part that we see him, because he's in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and then they, basically in chapter 5 is somebody else, chapter 6 is somebody else. So he's only in the first four chapters. But what we see about this man is that he's brilliant. He's a builder of things. He's smart. He's wise. But he has a terrible terrible temper. You remember at the very start of chapter 2, when nobody could tell him the dream, he said, I'll just kill every one of the wise men. He was so mad. I'll just kill every wise man. That's how he is. So look what it says there. Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and anger gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Now, this is not a happy time. If you're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what are you expecting? You're expecting you're going to be killed. That's what you're expecting. You're expecting that, that he might not even throw you in the fiery furnace. He might have you killed right that exact moment because he's so mad. But you also know that if the promise was that if you don't bow down, you're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. So look what Nebuchadnezzar does. And I think this is one time Nebuchadnezzar's smart. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them. He didn't just kill them. He just said, let me ask you a question. Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image which I have set up? Is it true that you didn't bow down? Is it true? He's going to give them a chance to answer. And uh, this is amazing to me because his char Nebuchadnezzar's character is such, he didn't give anybody any time to do anything. He gives them a second chance. Watch. Now, if you're ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all the other music, to fall down... And to worship the image that I made, good, that's great. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a blazing furnace. And then look at the statement. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Now, you know what he's actually saying? I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And listen, I'm so powerful. There's no God around here can stop me from doing anything that I want. Who wanted to be worshipped in this whole passage Nebuchadnezzar. And so he says, what God can stop me? Now let me tell you something. Nebuchadnezzar saw back in chapter 2 that God is a God who reveals. Daniel's God told him the dream and the future. So Nebuchadnezzar knows that God is a God who reveals, but he doesn't know the power of God. He doesn't know what God does yet. So he says, who can deliver you? And by the way, we have a God. God is our Savior. Our Savior God has delivered us from the bondage of sin. We have a God who delivers. Jesus Christ died and rose again, paying for sin and conquering death. We have a deliverer and a Savior, Jesus Christ. He delivered every one of us who put our faith in Christ as Savior. Well, what's going to happen? What would you do? You think maybe Nebuchadnezzar would say, I think I understand what y'all are talking about. <laughs> I don't think so. Compromise. It's so easy. Think about this. What if they said, what if, what if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, look, 
let's bow down. But we're not really worshiping. Nobody will know. We, we can bow down. We're not, we're not worshiping, but everybody thinks we are. We're not, we could do that, and we won't die. Or, you know, the Bible says obey the government, and the king tells us to bow down, so maybe we should obey. Or, well, nobody would really, really know because, I mean, it's such a big crowd. Who's going to know whether we're bowing down or not? And if we get to stay alive, we'll still get to tell the truth about the true God. You can see how the compromises are? See, if I bow down, it's not really worship. But people are going to see you and they're going to say, you worshiped a false God. I thought you worshiped something else. Well, the Bible says, obey the law of the government as long as it doesn't contradict the scripture. No one will know. Yes, people will know. Well, I can stay alive and witness. Nobody's going to listen to you. You cannot compromise the truths of the scripture and expect to be able to stand for Christ in our culture. You cannot blend in with the culture and expect to stand for Christ in the culture. It won't happen. You may have situations in which people are telling you or wanting you to do something that's contrary to the Bible because everybody else does it. Nobody will see it. Nobody cares. Who cares? There are college students that go on that campus every day and they have to stand for Christ because they go into classes in which the message of Christ and the Bible and Christianity is attacked and they have to stand for the truth. And it may be you, some of you in jobs, in families, in which you are the only one standing for the truth of the Bible. And you're going to have to do it. Well, what do they say? Watch what happened. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Now, there are three statements they make. Here's the first one. We don't need to give you an answer. That literally mean, didn't mean that we're not going to answer him. It says, we don't have to think about this. This is what this says. We don't have to think about this. They already made a decision. What was their decision? Not bow down. He says, bow down. They don't have to say, uh, let us, let's get in the huddle. Do you think we should bow down or not? No. They already made the decision. They looked at him and said, we don't need to answer you on this one. See, some of the times that we get messed up is because we don't decide beforehand what we're going to stand for. And when the pressures come, we yield because we hadn't already decided what we're going to do and what's right. And so they said, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to really talk about this. We don't need to give you this answer. We already decided. And then they said this in verse 17. It says, if so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire, he will deliver us out of your hand. They said, maybe God will deliver us, maybe not. God's able if he wants to. When you throw us in the fiery furnace, he can deliver us out of there. It's not a question of whether he can. It's just a question of whether he will. And we don't know whether he will or not. So then the third thing they say is in verse 18, if God doesn't deliver us, it doesn't matter. We're not going to worship or serve the idol. Listen to what they say. But even if God does not deliver us, let us be known to you, O king, that we're not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. What would you do? Would you trust God? Would you say, God says, don't bow to some image. This is, so I'm not going to do it. There are people in parts of the world that they come in to Christian churches, homes, come in with weapons, and they basically say, deny this Jesus or you die. What would you do? They have a choice. I'm going to deny him or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to and maybe live or I'm going to say, I'm standing for Christ and I may die. What would you do? There are people in the world making those choices right now. You think maybe Nebuchadnezzar would look at him and go, you know, you guys are right. Yeah, you don't have to bow down. Is that what you think he's going to do? We already know. Look at verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He's fixing to throw them in, not just a hot, hot fire, the hottest fire he can come up with. What would we do? What are you going to do when you walk out these doors? And you are challenged to go contrary to what you know is right. What are you going to do? 
Nebuchadnezzar built an image and wanted all to worship and charges were made against the three men because they didn't bow down and Nebuchadnezzar gave them a second chance but they said, no, we will trust God. We don't know what he's going to do but we're going to trust him. So applications, are you and I willing to trust God even when we're unsure of the outcome? We don't know what's going to happen. How do we respond? I mean, somebody challenges us. Are we going to live by the Scripture or are we going to fold? We don't know. We can say, well, I don't know what's going to happen. What if I do live by the Scripture? What's going to happen to me? Well, faith, we trust God. Or compromise. We may lose our testimony. Who knows? Compromise is easy because it's the natural thing to do. To say, well, if I do this, if I do this, if I do this. Listen, we must make the decision before the time comes. When the pressure comes, you can't then try to decide what you think you should do. You ought to know beforehand what's right, what's wrong, and how you're going to stand. Second, be, let us be faithful now in little things so we can be faithful in the big things. Listen, that's how we grow. We look at the Bible. We see how these people trusted. We trust him day in and day out. Sometimes there's little things that we just say, no, this is what's right and this is not right. I'm going to do what's right. And as time goes by, the more we live by the scripture and stand for what is right, then the little things, we're faithful to the little things, we'll be faithful in the big things. It is always best to do what's right. Always. And the last thing I just want you to think about is do you have any, do you and I have any idols in our lives? Anything we put before God? Because Nebuchadnezzar was putting that idol up and everything. And these guys, there are people there who are worshiping the idols. What's more important? What's first in your life? We must stand for Christ in a fallen world. You remember, there is a false teaching out there. There is a false gospel out there. There are false ministers out there. They give different messages. Different messages than the Bible. Let's stand for Christ in a fallen world, let's don't have any idols, let's stand for him. So may we stand for Christ, even when we don't know the results. May we decide right now to live for God and our Savior, putting him first in our lives.